I'm doing this because I grew up in Muskegon and I love the whole area. I love the lakeshore, I love the dunes, I love the woods. It makes Muskegon special. We're the ones with the fresh water. We've got all the water everyone's going to come after soon. We need to take care of it. I've tried to pay at least somewhat attention to how our elected officials do or do not protect our public health and our environment. While I would like them to be concerned about their local environment and, and pay attention to the issues that are raised. How come we have money for war and not for clean water? We tend to think of the, the world of the heart and our feelings about the Great Lakes, perhaps the feeling you had if you went to the beach today, as one thing. And the world of government policy and the, the laws that protect the Great Lakes is another thing. But unless we connect the two, unless we act on the feeling that the Great Lakes are our home base, our, our place of comfort and something we need to take care of for future generations, these lakes are at great risk. Well, there's a, a lot of problems that we're facing as a national citizenry and uh, people living on Earth. That was me, celebrating the 4th of July with my family on the shores of Lake Michigan. We swam in the crashing surf, we built sandcastles, waving the flag high in triumph of our good fortune of being able to enjoy such an amazing place. It was a great day to celebrate our independence. There was a connection to the environment, an understanding of this gift that, like Margaret Mead says, we are borrowing from our children. It might seem instinctive that we take care of the planet the way it takes care of us. As individuals, we often claim to be doing our part, but as a society, our values seem to be somewhat masochistic when it comes to the environment. I wanted to learn more about our responsibility as patrons of this planet. On a recent spring break trip, I traveled to Washington, D.C. to visit with my friend Michelle. I brought my camera along to take some pictures of the monuments which I'd never seen outside of CNN or that movie with Will Smith where the aliens blew up the White House. It just so happens that one of the biggest water stories to be told was breaking the moment I got off the train at Union Station. Last stop for this train, Washington DC. Our nation's capital had a very serious problem with lead in the water infrastructure. I connected with some people working for Clean Water Action to find out more. In the last time they reauthorized the Safe Drinking Water Act, 
Congress saw fit to say that you can call something a lead-free plumbing fixture, like a faucet, it, but it can have up to 8% lead in it. When the water is highly corrosive and it's running through 8% lead in the fixtures, mm -hmm. that's going to leach lead. You know, it's going to happen. Washington did have highly corrosive water. Is there any water? Well, I think they've shut it down because the water here is kind of bad. But it was two years before the EPA, the Water and Sewer Administration, or the Army Corps of Engineers came out and told the public that they were drinking a lot of lead. Sometimes you have powerful corporate interests or powerful government agencies really spinning their side of the story. There was a hearing the following day on Capitol Hill to discuss the problem of lead. Whatever said by people testifying today, in the end, isn't going to determine what happens with the situation on the ground. It's really people mobilizing that's going to make the difference. Oh, they're Look bringing how in ironic. Uh -huh. Here we are uh, outside the building where we're going to decide uh, how we're going to deal with the lead in the water. And they've been gracious enough to bring all this bottled water. Progress. I wasn't allowed to bring my camera in to record the hearing, but I later got hold of an audio tape. Depending upon uh, the length and, and level of exposure, it can delay the physical and mental development of children. Uh, it, it causes deficits in the attention span, in hearing, in the learning abilities of children, and in adults, it can lead to strokes, uh, kidney disease, and cancer. The Water and Sewer Administration had conducted some tests on wells in Washington, D.C. When they found elevated levels of lead, manager Seema S. Bott decided to tell the Environmental Protection Agency and was then fired by the Water and Sewer Administration. One of the key questions is whether our uh, cops, federal cops, are going to do their jobs to uh, enforce the laws that are on the books. Congressman Chris Van Hollen from Maryland summed it up rather pointedly. There are lots of serious issues that have been raised by this. I mean, number, number one is you know, what went wrong, why did we have such lead contamination in the water. The second thing is when people found out about it, what did they do in terms of notifying the public? I mean, there are serious questions on both ends. I mean, figuring out what's causing the lead contamination, which is important to the District of Columbia and this region and the nation, potentially. Right. Uh, and second, you know, what do you do when you find out the problem? How do you avoid the public? And clearly, uh, they fell down on that issue. While firing Seema Bot may have been a big mistake on the part of the Water and Sewer Administration, it was ultimately the responsibility of the Environmental Protection Agency to do something with the information she had given them, and that's what took two years. It's the tendency of big bureaucracies to want to have the public be quiet and sit over there, if only to make their job easier, and so it's really, really important that people feel that they need to get involved and that they demonstrate their right to get involved in whatever way is appropriate because um, otherwise they, it will always be easiest to leave you out of it. I'm pretty much of a cynic about EPA in general. I think that like a lot of other uh, Washington bureaucracies or state bureaucracies or local bureaucracies, they've been captured by uh, the communities that they're supposed to regulate. The situation in Washington, D.C. demonstrates that the Environmental Protection Agency and other organizations designed to oversee human health and the environment aren't always looking out for our best interest. It's oftentimes up to the individual to be aware and do their own research so that if a problem arises, they'll already be prepared for it. Otherwise, we can expect two-year delays on getting that information. The other big question is, if this can happen in Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, then how can those smaller cities around the United States expect to be treated when it comes to human health and the environment? You haven't seen America till you've seen it from a train. On the way back to Michigan, the Amtrak stops in Chicago before it heads up to Grand Rapids. It gives you a pretty interesting view of some of the things you wouldn't normally see, like Gary, Indiana. In Michigan, 
much like in Washington, D.C. The Environmental Protection Agency is the final authority on human health and the environment. At the state level, though, most concerns are sent to the Department of Environmental Quality. There have been a number of questions as to whether the DEQ can do its job. With no money, low manpower, and suspicions of a bias towards the industries they're supposed to be regulating, the citizens in Michigan have been raising a number of concerns. The groundwater is contaminated in a great portion of the much regarded as free uh, spray of uh, herbicides for weeds. Oh, it's very, very interesting. The public is Most of their questions are directed towards this man, Director Stephen Chester. Underfunding is a problem. In uh, 1988 and 89, in Ottawa County, they used to throw about five ton of road salt per two lane road mile. Now they're throwing 50 ton of road salt per two lane road mile. The chloride levels in uh, Lake Michigan 40 years ago were non detectable. Now you're between 12 and 15 parts. It's going up six tenths of a part per million per year. History lesson. When the Romans conquered Carthage in BC, they salted the fields so they couldn't grow any crops to starve their adversaries. I would think in AD, we'd be a little smarter than BC. Our cleanup funds, the funds we use to clean up contaminated sites, are quickly uh, uh, diminishing. And if we don't find additional funding Starting in fiscal year 06, we will not have the ability to continue our cleanup programs. If you're talking about raising the fees on the individuals in this state to make up for debt loss, then why aren't you going after the people that we've already documented as being violators and retrieve some of those fines to relieve some of the burden on the people that are following the rules? The truth of it is, we're, we're, we are terribly understaffed, so we can only get to so many things. We get uh, jerked around quite a bit in different directions. Since taking office in the past three years, Stephen Chester has had his hands full. Regardless of what kind of job they're told to do, they've been had their funding cut by 50%. So without funding for staff, they can't, they can't do their job efficiently. The one gentleman at the public meeting had a great idea. Start charging the people that are polluting to do the polluting. How much does Michigan charge to pollute? Nothing. Not a penny. There's no fee to apply for the permit. Nada, nada, nada. No fee. Of the Great Lakes states, Michigan is the only one that does not charge anything. Does that make any sense? We're the Great Lakes state. It says so on our license plate. We're the only state not charging people to pollute? Well, how much stuff's going into our lakes, rivers, and streams every year? They're dumping legally one million pounds of toxic chemicals in the water every year. So when you add up the arsenic and the mercury and the lead and the cyanide and the DDT and the PCBs and the other 300 chemicals, there's 307 toxic chemicals that they track that are allowed to be dumped. Um, it adds up to a million pounds a year. And it doesn't, it's the kind of stuff, mercury doesn't go away. But there are people out there that are very willing to help you do the job you're supposed to do. And we're at the, the ground level. We know what's going on in our township. We know what's happening with our environment. And we could help you. And the other thing is to coordinate some more of this. I think probably you're in that process of doing that. And here is a wealth of people who know lots of things. You hear the problems. You're hearing the problems. So how can we work together? I had mixed feelings as I drove home from the public meeting. I knew that Stephen Chester and the Department of Environmental Quality wanted nothing more than to protect human health and the environment in this state. But their hands were tied. But I was excited to find out that there were citizens who were willing to stand up and defend what they believe in despite those odds. When I got back to Muskegon, I would find some people that were doing exactly that. By the time I met up with the concerned citizens of Norton Shores, they had already lost a battle or two. 
Some people who live on the lakeshore in Muskegon County are upset about what they say is a chemical discharge. A classic battle pitting development against environment. The Nugent Sand Company. The Nugent Sand Company. The Nugent Sand Company. The Nugent Sand Company wants to use a 600 foot industrial pipeline through that dune over there, through a critical dune area, to discharge 8 million gallons of wastewater a day into Lake Michigan, making room for a housing development. Several agencies and local governments are against this. The company says the pipeline won't hurt the dunes or the lake. It will ruin it. Plain and simple, ruin it. There needs to be an awakening amongst the public that once our fresh waters are gone, they're gone. The Nugent Sand Company is located just east of Lake Michigan on Lincoln Street, south of Sherman Boulevard. On its property are two lakes. The newer lake, the one to the north, is currently being mined, and the old lake to the south is where they want to build a housing development. Nugent claims they need to lower the lake level to do so which means building a pipeline and dumping the water and the wastewater into Lake Michigan. Where it goes from there is anyone's guess. Although a number of municipalities in and around Muskegon signed resolutions against Nugent's idea, Administrative Law Judge Richard Patterson approved the pipeline. It was then sent back to Director Stephen Chester at the Department of Environmental Quality for review. During this time, the citizens in Norton Shores were trying to raise awareness on the consequences of putting a pipeline through the dune. They were led by this woman, Darlene DeHuty. She doesn't even live on Lake Michigan, and she's leading the fight. So let me get this right. There, there's an intake out there. Right. That sucks in water, then, then, then it's right. given to you to drink. Right. And in between the two of them, there's this waste water outlet. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Doesn't it? I, I don't know. It doesn't make any sense to anyone. We talked and, tr and got these signatures from people Hardly anyone, anywhere, said no, because they wouldn't sign it. This is Pigeon Hill, probably around 1920. Sitting right in between Muskegon Lake and Lake Michigan, it was the tallest dune in this part of the state, probably around 200 feet high. It got its name from the passenger pigeons that used to live in the thousands atop the dune. It had a club, too. All you had to do was climb to the top, and you were a member of the Pigeon Hill Club. You could look out for miles in any direction. A race to the bottom with your friends and then jump into Lake Michigan to cool off. Its then owner, D.D. Irwin, decided he wanted to sell Pigeon Hill to the city of Muskegon, perhaps for a park or public land. But the city didn't have much interest in purchasing the landmark, so he sold Pigeon Hill to the railroad, and the railroad sold it to Newton Sand Company. If you were to visit Pigeon Hill today, this is what you'd see. You won't find any pigeons. They were all hunted to extinction and sold as a delicacy to New York's finest. You won't find any Pigeon Hill, either. You may find Pigeon Hill Court, though. The dune was gone by the early 1960s, but the Nugent Sand Company is still well enough alive. This used to be rolling dunes out here. There's no lake at all. Three dunes. Three dunes. This is their closed mining area. This has been now reclaimed by planting the dune grass. I, I'm sure the question is going to come up, well, why, why do we need this permit? The South Lake continues to rise in elevation. So it's hard to start a development not knowing where the ultimate elevation is going to be. So it's gone up considerably more than what experts had ever predicted. As Nugent's experts had been wrong in predicting the eventual height of the South Lake, the citizens had a growing concern as to whether or not the intelligence that was put forth to determine the safety of putting the pipeline through the dune would be any more accurate. If it were not safe, we wouldn't do it. Uh, we investigated, consulted with uh, experts before we even proceeded. Those pipes out there are either 34 or 36 inch. They're planned, they're gonna bore through the dune with a 36 inch and then sleeve in a 34 inch to go through and have a joint in the middle underneath the dune. And that's where a potential leak could occur. They're just gonna put a hole in the dune. And run water through it. It's public beach to walk here. If you have eight million gallons dumping on the beach, you're gonna have hey. kids down here playing in that water and. You know, this giant pipeline's going to be dumping out and cutting off our access. What we're proposing isn't just something we pulled out of the sky and said, this is what we're going to do. Again, experts, a lot smarter than I am, have analyzed the pipe going through, the design of the discharge area. There's a hell of a lot of money, time and effort, on a lot of people's part that went into the research that came up with what we're proposing. It's solid. It's based on science. It's not hypothetical. I, I don't know what else I can say. 
In an effort to boost their public image, Bob Shandonette and the Nugent Sand Company took out a full page ad in the Muskegon Chronicle explaining what it is they're trying to do, complete with an artist's rendition of what the pipeline might look like where put through the dune. It ended up looking more like a beautification project than something that was destructive or adverse towards the environment. I find it hard to believe that the pipeline would look anything like the drawing that was in the Muskegon Chronicle. But I thought that something should be done with that land. They could send the wastewater to Muskegon Lake, or have it treated properly at the wastewater treatment facility. But what was in that water? If they're going to be building houses around it, was that water safe for kids to swim in? To drink? You know, he's under uh, an order from the DEQ to give us potable water. That's a, that's a year ago. And what he did was, um, uh, he's such a good corporate citizen that he appealed the whole order. So what, what that's meant for us is that we've gone a whole year without water. This is Gail Law. For decades, she has lived next to Nugent Sands Norton Shores property. She's concerned about the pipeline being put through the dune and dumping the wastewater on the beach as it'll practically be on her beach. But she's more concerned with what might be coming through that pipeline. For years, she's noticed her own groundwater deteriorate as it leaches off of Nugent's property into her well water. This is what's really ironic, is the people used to come out there, those cottages have been in the same families for years, and get water. Because it wasn't city water, didn't have chlorine, and it was, it was just wonderful water. It was, you know, something they took home and, and drank because it was better than city water. If you look at the water coming from Gail's property today, it's pretty obvious that you shouldn't drink it or bathe in it. So what's happening to the water that's coming off of Nugent's property? Nugent tells us it appears the material is natural iron in the sand which leaves a reddish residue. If it was naturally occurring iron that was in Gail's water, then why hadn't it been that way in years past? Was something happening that was putting more iron in the water? I was able to come across some documents that elaborated upon what Nugent Sand was dumping in their wastewater. Well, it did include iron, which they were allowed to dump at a rate of 0.02 milligrams per liter of water. But Nugent was dumping a little bit more than that, sometimes 2.5 milligrams per liter, or 4.5 milligrams per liter a rate 225 times what they were allowed to dump in their wastewater. Sand mining itself does not include dumping iron into wastewater. But if the sand that you're mining has iron already in it, and you take away the sand and put back the iron, then you're offsetting the balance of iron to sand. That's exactly what Nugent's been doing, and that's what's affecting Gale's groundwater. To learn more about what iron can actually do to a human being, I went to talk to Dr. Eugene Weinberg down at Indiana University. He also works at the Iron Disorders Institute. He's written a book called The Hidden Dangers of Iron. I, my first interaction with uh, an iron problem was in Vermont. and uh, There was a farmer that had a beautiful farm, but he was uh, downstream of a, um, a paper mill. And he was getting iron in the effluent. And it got so bad that he, he knew that he could not drink that well water because it was orange, actually. And, uh, there are bacteria that uh, get into the water and they load up the iron and, and it was just impossible to drink for uh, just the taste of the water, but he knew it was damaging and we knew it was damaging and we argued with the Environmental Protection Agency of the state of Vermont and we got nowhere. They follow the guidelines of EPA in, in D.C., of the federal EPA, and uh, the EPA in D.C. Uh, uh, didn't care about iron, so they weren't going to care about iron. And we see uh, something similar with the state of Michigan. Uh, that is, uh, the EPA people don't have any standards for iron. Uh, they don't know what the tolerable limits should be. And uh, I suspect this is true of, uh, of other states as well. Well, it took the EPA in Washington, D.C. two years to care about lead in the water there. Why would they care about iron in Michigan? Most people that evaluate the environment have not been concerned about measuring the amount of iron in, in water supplies. You autopsy the brains of people who've died of Alzheimer's or of Parkinson's or of multiple sclerosis, Lou Gehrig disease, and all sorts of neurodegenerative diseases. You see deposits of iron. And uh, this iron is part of the problem. It's part of the pathology of these neurodegenerative diseases. In fact, people that are iron-loaded who are also subject to coming down with Alzheimer's will come down five, ten years earlier in their life 
uh, if they have this extra uh, iron burden. You know, this is something that affects everyone. That is why it has been such a big issue, because it's everybody's drinking water. Yeah. It isn't just water. Oh no, it, a whole lot of it, 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 Yet, when you talk with someone, they say, well, yeah, they're going to ruin the water. So wait a minute, that's only part of it. And to me, it's just as equally as sad to have them destroy a beach, to use up a natural resource that we only have one of, so to speak. I, I don't know why anybody in their right mind would approve of dumping anything in the lake. Doesn't make any difference what it is, poisonous, non-poisonous, whatever. Uh, things that have gone on and destroyed a natural resource without any real reason. $840 per million gallons. So that's a lot of money. So they can shoot it out into Lake Michigan for free, but we have to drink it. I, I don't know what else I can say. We're going to comply with the law, period. DEQ had stated that they don't have a how-to book when it comes to dealing with critical dunes. I was wondering, with that in mind, what, what factors you're considering now when dealing with this critical dune in Muskegon and whether or not to put a pipeline through it. Okay. Well, that's an easy answer for me. I'm the final decision maker, and I can't talk about that case. I, I simply cannot talk about it. While the citizens waited to hear from Stephen Chester and the Department of Environmental Quality over whether or not a pipeline would be put through the dune, Gail Law and the other citizens of Idlewild filed suit against Newton Sand Company over the quality of their groundwater and a number of other issues. All right, it's 14th Circuit Court for the County of Muskegon now resumes. <clears throat> Gentlemen, there's the parties. Good morning. The file number is 044306ce Ida Wild Protective Association and numerous other individuals versus Nugent Sand Company. We want someone to be looking at the beach. Chris Bizdock, representing the citizens of the Ida Wild Protective Association, argued that the Nugent Sand Company had endangered the beach, destroyed the drinking water in the area, and put the citizens' health at risk as a result of the mining activities. I know that the water in Idlewild today looks like this. This is this morning. It's still, this is what comes out of the tap this morning. This is the Law Fry House. So I know that the water right now looks like that coming out of the tap. That's, that's what we know. He continued by arguing that Nugent Sand Company should be held responsible for its actions, that the beach needed to be monitored continuously, that the citizens should be compensated for the depreciating value of their properties, and that Nugent Sand Company should absorb the cost of installing city water at the citizens' homes. And we want city water. We don't want to be guinea pigs. We don't want to wonder what else is coming through this contaminated water. Can I order Nugent to provide city water in this lawsuit? Yes, I believe that you can. Devin Schindler, representing the Nugent Sand Company, argued that Nugent was operating well within the guidelines as stated in the permit issued by the Department of Environmental Quality. Yeah, I was very surprised uh, by Mr. Uh, Bizdock's uh, brief on that issue, although he's a very bright man who I respect. Your Honor, he knows and I... He added that the Nugent Sand Company was already acting within the guidelines of the response activity ordered by the Department of Environmental Quality, which included providing the citizens' homes with water filtration systems or bottled water. In terms of policy, doesn't your interpretation raised the specter of some mischief. You sue by the citizens, you get the bad judge, you don't like the way that's going, and you say, you know what we're going to do? We're going to go ahead and pursue the administrative action, which is, of course, no jury trial, and by getting the administrative action, we trump the lawsuit. Well, you don't completely trump the lawsuit because, again, under part The attorneys argued back and forth for some time over issues such as water quality and whether or not Nugent was responsible for those issues. Ultimately, the judge decided that there was enough evidence to go to trial. We've got some evidence here. Now, whether in the end the jurors or I believe it isn't the issue. But there's enough evidence submitted here to make me think that there is some effect on the property. The citizens had placed their case in the hands of the court of law. Whether or not in the end that would mean that their water would be safe to drink again or the Nugent Sand Company would continue operating in Muskegon was unclear. But it was a small victory. A victory that meant that they would get their day in court. Hopefully, justice would prevail. We've got an incredible resource. If people thought of preserving, and they do in many communities now, and they have thought this way for a decade at least, where they're preserving open spaces and natural areas and emphasizing their natural qualities, 
we wouldn't have these problems. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even be working on this right now. In fact, I'd be working on the opposite, which would be, okay, here's an award-winning community because we integrated development into the natural resources and we didn't destroy them. Are you going to win this fight? I have no idea. I have no idea. When a small group of ordinary people set out to do extraordinary things, oftentimes the odds are against them. What was certain, what these people were trying to do could affect the lives of many people. Perhaps there was comfort in knowing that this had been done before. Like in my hometown, near White Lake, Michigan. We're currently on board the W.G. Jackson research vessel for Grand Valley State University. I'd like to welcome you to celebrate White Lake and also to a bigger part of the program here which is called Making Lake Michigan Great. We're taking out our second tour today. Uh, we're going to learn a little bit about what it is they do on a typical day of research and talk with some of the people on board to find out more because of the problems that White Lake has had in the past with uh, polluters. Uh, years ago there was the Hooker Chemical Company and the Whitehall Leather Company, the tannery. It was the research done by this vessel that prompted further investigation that then led to remediation of those sites. White Lake Municipal! White Lake Municipal! This is W.G. Jackson. This is the White Lake Municipal. Go ahead! Top of the day! W.G. Jackson coming in uh, for your White Lake days. Understand we got our uh, normal dock there to the east of you. Is that affirmative? Yes, sir. The uh, end of the pier is open. And we'll send someone down there to catch a line from you, over. Your princess, appreciate it very much. Thank you very much. If there's nothing further, this is White Lake Clearance 72. Tuning by at 09. Well, today we're giving public tours of the lake and showing them how we sample when we're on board the vessel with students. This current cruise that we're on right now, we're going to go over to the part of the lake that was dredged last year to get rid of uh, toxic sediments and we're going to take some samples and see if we can find any life forms uh, in the uh, benthic sample, the bottom sample. When they sampled it previously, they referred to it as the dead zone because they couldn't find any life forms in the uh, bottom sediments. We had a couple chemical plants move in and managed to give off some not too friendly byproducts that got into the groundwater. People who travel through here say, what a marvelous place to live. You have all that clean water. Well. We don't have all that clean water. People got to realize that we're going to have a situation around here soon where people are going to be really getting ill. What's it going to take to wait for people up to what's going on? A tragedy. A tragedy. It, it already happened. People cannot believe what it's like out there unless they've been out there. You have no way of fathoming, you know, you can't imagine just how bad it is. When Hooker Chemical Company built a plant in Montague, Michigan on White Lake, it was thought by many to be a savior. At a time when jobs were scarce, the chemical companies brought new hope to a fleeting economy. But what people didn't know was killing them. This is Warren Dobson. Together with his attorney, Wint Dahlstrom, he would come forth to the public with information that would perhaps save lives and ultimately alter the course of history in the White Lake area. Quitting what was then a high paying industrial position at Hooker Chemical Company, he would take a stand that set in motion events that are still being played out today. Generally, they don't care how they operate as far as pollution goes because money, you know, as in most corporations, I guess, the biggest, the biggest interest. Uh, a commonly heard phrase around there is, this is not a chocolate factory. Wimp, we're sitting out here on a beautiful sunny day next to a beautiful shimmering lake. Is it safe? beautiful shimmering lake is a reflection of the beautiful sky today, I'm afraid. No, it's not safe. What's Hooker putting in here? Sulfates, chlorides, 
C56 hexachlorocyclopentadiena. They'll deny this now because they're under orders uh, by the Water Resources Commission not to put any more of the chlorinated hydrocarbons in the lake. But of course, they were under orders not to do that years ago, and they violated it. C56 is is just terribly toxic. It's the toxin in pesticides. That's what's being made over here. But the citizens weren't anxious to believe that the health of their beautiful lake, and perhaps even their own health, was anything like in jeopardy. After all, Hooker Chemical Company and even the Whitehall Leather Company just across the lake were both key employers in this part of the community. Any threat to those industries might also be a threat to the economic well-being of the community as well. Today in the picturesque twin cities of Montague and Whitehall, the residents thrive on their pride in their communities and the enjoyment of what is here. What do you think about Hooker Chemical? Well, I think it's been an asset to the community in spite of the drawbacks. I probably have mixed emotions about this whole thing. Convincing the citizens wasn't their only problem. They also had to convince the Department of Natural Resources, who at the time had authority over the environmental issues in the state of Michigan. I suspect that there are all, all degrees of uh, confidence in the DNR in the White Lake community. Uh, I believe they have reason to, to have improved confidence. Uh, I don't think it's any time for them to relax. I don't think it's any time for DNR to relax. I think we've got a ways to go with the hooker matter. In the past, the attitude was to try and cooperate with industry as much as possible to try and work uh, cooperatively to resolve their problems. And it worked fine for the companies who wanted to cooperate. But with the hooker chemical companies and the store chemical companies, the companies who, whose attitude was we're going to stall, obfuscate, uh, we're not going to cooperate, uh, the mechanism wasn't there to do anything once the company said no. Well, this man finally is being honest with me. Now he stopped denying things. He's going to ask me for help. And I said, so I'm going to try to help him. And I don't know anything about it. That's his problem. The citizen makes his mistake by undertaking to try to solve the industrialist problem. I'm not making C-5 safe. They're making it. They're the precocious people who have put this uh, fiendish little molecule together. Now let them take it apart. And it's my job as a citizen is simply to say, knock it off. That's my lady. I think that if the citizens catch on to it before government does, the citizens ought to be able to raise hell and the government ought to do something. I would like to see the government able to move on these things before it became a matter of citizens' concern. When the Department of Natural Resources finally conducted an investigation on Hooker Chemicals' property, they found something that would absolutely convince them that Hooker was causing a problem. A big problem. Some 20,000 barrels of toxic chemical waste had been piled high, hidden behind the trees north of Hooker's plant. C-5-6 wastes were seeping into the ground, right into the groundwater, being carried slowly on their way to White Lake. The state ordered Hooker Chemical Company to pay for a massive cleanup operation that included moving 3.2 million cubic yards of toxic waste from the ground. On their property, they built something they called the vault, a giant chemical landfill, some 800 by 800 feet, 90 feet tall, with 10 foot thick clay lined walls, where the chemicals would be housed for an indefinite amount of time. Years later, after further investigation, they realized that toxic sediments were still at the bottom of White Lake, and a second cleanup, a focused dredging at the bottom of the lake, would remove even more chemicals. Was the job now finished? Would there be some hope that things in White Lake would again return to normal? What was normal, anyway? Normal in White Lake was starting to look like dealing with these sorts of problems indefinitely. I hope something comes out of this because I thought it was important enough that I, I gave up my job there. When I gave up my job, it wasn't a spur of the moment thing. I had thought about it and was angered about it and it just took that eight inch line leaking for me to make up my mind because I have obligations to people, you know, I owe people money like most people do and I have four children. People had better wake up. That's all I can say. They've been told and they've been warned. There's an illness in the community and it has to be taken care of before, before it becomes terminal.
years there's been a variety of industries around the lake that have uh, used the lake to uh, dispose of their waste. It was legal at the time, it's not now, and so we're kind of paying uh, a little bit of a price in terms of needing to clean up. Why don't you gather around here, you can come right up close, and we'll try to get you kind of acclimated to what the tests are looking for and what we hope to find or don't find to give you kind of a base point. What is your job on board the Jacks? Oh, I'm an instructor. Um, I, we take classes out and I teach them how to test for water, teach them all about the different qualities of water. Just a baby drop. Okay, give it a shake. How about now? It's clear. Okay, so we have one milligram per liter of oxygen. That's not good. We went over by the tannery in um, White Lake, and that was an area where they had used to just dump the hides and dump all the scrap materials, uh, so it was pretty bad. I know they did a lot of dredging last year. Is it really safe to handle anything that you bring up without protection? I, I really don't know, but we can, uh, we can uh, put on gloves uh, when we wash through our sediment that we bring up there. Yeah, a lot of things were possibly at the time legally discharged into the lake, maybe some of it illegally, but there was a lot of contaminants on the bottom of the lake. Did you guys ever have problems with your drinking water? No, no, in fact, we're in a, a safe zone on the lake. There's pollution in the groundwater west of us and there's pollution in the groundwater east of us. But um, through education they've told us where the plume is moving and it doesn't seem to be moving in our direction. So, so you're a lucky person. I, for, for the time being, yes. It's a shame that such a beautiful area has ever had to deal with these kinds of pollution problems because further north where they don't have these kinds of companies they don't worry about what's coming out of the ground. The uh, Hooker Chemical no longer operates. DuPont no longer operates here. Those systems are closed, and the only operations they have are remediation programs. I was up here and uh, listened to my grandma's lamentations about the Hooker plant and all the damage that was done then, and I think we're still in a recovery period. Do you ever eat any done. fish out of the lake? We do. Maybe at one point we thought, well, maybe we shouldn't have been eating as much fish as we did. Yeah. But. The citizens came out in hopes of hearing good news about the condition of their lake today. As the Jackson hovered carefully above a site that had been referred to as the dead zone, where Hooker had been dumping its toxic chemicals for years and years, the citizens watched anxiously as test tubes and clam buckets were sunk to the bottom into the muddy sediment. Later on, we'll look at this under the scope when we're heading back in. There is a, a part of the lake that I guess is referred to as the dead zone. Hopefully not anymore. <laughs> if we had gone to that part of the lake prior to the dredging, Chuck, what might we have found? Nothing. Nothing living, in other words. They put the slide underneath the microscope, and they found something. Life. Life that wasn't there before. In fact, it was life that probably hadn't lived in that part of White Lake for 50 years. So they weren't finding those worms before the dredging? No, it was referred to it as the dead zone. So it's not dead anymore? Well, it doesn't appear. Like, we've got a nice bloom of blue-green bacteria. I thought we were just going to get a rundown on the boat itself. I didn't realize it was going to entail a ride and experiments, and it's, this has been wonderful. I didn't know that these little red blood worms are a very good thing, and we picked them up at 62 feet out there, so now they're there, and I don't understand why suddenly they're there, but... Well, they hopefully that up. means that they, they've cleaned up some problems. Hey, we've summered here my whole life. It just reinforced for me that we're making progress. I think we've made some quantum uh, leaps, uh, and so I think that's a significant step for the remediation of White Lake. The people of White Lake had something to celebrate today. The situation wasn't perfect, but it was improving. Perhaps now they could take their attention off of fish advisories and swim warnings and focus more now on just the lake. Things were going to be different, and different was good.
several individuals stood up against odds that were against them. Warren Dobson and Wynton Dahlstrom couldn't be here to enjoy the gift that they'd given the White Lake community. Hope. We're surrounded by 20% of the world's fresh water. So, you know, it shouldn't be a big surprise we're known as the Great Lakes State. If we expect our so-called leaders to protect the environment, uh, we're doomed. We have to lead them to do the things that are required to protect the environment. So there is communication, but it needs to be more, and it needs to be strategic, and we need to make sure that um, it's, it's bigger and louder. The biggest problem, I would say, is getting the correct information to the public. They're on a mission, as are we. Our, our mission, hopefully, is going to carry us through to uh, providing the ability to put the pipeline in and begin our development. Until we get to the point, you know, where we have people who say, let's err on the side of caution. Let's not put this stuff into Lake Michigan until we do know. But until we start taking that stand versus, well, let's see what happens and whether or not it contaminates our well. <laughs> It's, it's all bass backwards, just like the pollution prevention program. It should be pollution prevention, not permits to pollute. If we can ever get that point across and get that much legislation passed and enforced, get all these things taken care of, we might, the human race might have a chance of surviving. Otherwise, the human race is going to disappear. I hope that the light and sunshine of the moment will translate into lasting change. My belief is it won't unless citizens get mobilized and take action collectively to make a difference. It's amazing what people can accomplish when they put their best sense together for a common goal. And although the effort to preserve the environment appears to be very much against the grain of a growing culture that nurtures the idea of disposability and instant gratification, I believe there remains hope so long as this effort is true and steadfast. The battle may never be fully won, but so long as a few people can make the distinction between the needs of a cell phone and that of our own health, perhaps we can help others to remember that it's not so easy to plug in a source of life like Lake Michigan when its battery dies. While we proceed to safeguard our national interests, let us also safeguard human interests. Our problems are man-made, therefore they can be solved by man, and man can be as big as he wants. No problem of human destiny is beyond human beings. Man's reason and spirit have often solved the seemingly unsolvable, and we believe they can do it again. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's futures, and we are all mortal. like it's surreal 
It's not even like this is actually happening. Because it's almost like everything I hoped it would be. So when when did you find out, darling? Oh, about 11 o'clock today. Okay. Doug Bennett called me. Uh-huh. I thought I was getting the flu or something, but after I heard that, the symptoms disappeared. I jumped out of bed and I couldn't stop screaming. <laughs> I wish somebody had been here so I could have yelled and screamed and grabbed them and hugged yeah. them and all that. Oh, that's so oh awesome. I could not believe it. So that I can read it. Got it? Big Lake Pipeline denied. An outspoken critic <laughs> of the proposed pipeline said she was thrilled by the decision. It's the best Christmas present we could ever have, said Darlene DeHutie, Vice President. <laughs> and that is exactly what I told him. I was so excited. <laughs> and this is hard, but... We did, we did the best we could. So no matter how it would have turned out, we couldn't have done any more. What do you, what do you do now? You, you, you just said you've been doing this for two years. Now, now what do you do? I think we're gonna have a party. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what you expected me to say, did it?